Well, good morning, Janice. Good morning. It's great to be with you, and thank you for joining us. Um, I, I'm having a little trouble trying to figure out how to start, actually, and I'm thinking um, maybe a general question mm -hmm. about what brought you here. What brought me to this planet? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> what brought me here? Well, um, let's go to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in a different place now, and place is a really important concept for you, as for so many of us in conservation, mm -hmm. connecting to place. And yet we feel the need to go farther afield sometime to share our ideas and to listen to others. Mm -hmm. And so we're far from your place. Mm -hmm. um, help us understand where you're coming from. Maybe that would okay. be a better way to yes. start off. So I was raised, I, I was born in southern Georgia on a junkyard. And um, I traveled around going off to school and doing other things. And then at some point I realized that I knew more about other ecosystems than I did my own ecosystem, which was longleaf pine. And that I also, I, I just, I felt, I began to understand that it's imperative that humans honor their place. I mean, we're made of places. The, the, the water that runs all through the Altamaha River also runs through my veins. I am the, the granite and minerals that erode down out of the Appalachian Mountains. And so um, I come from a place, luckily, where many generations of my people have born, been born and died. And it made sense for me to want to go back. And so I did, after many, many years of working out elsewhere and studying elsewhere, I went back to southern Georgia. We have a farm there. And I will be happy. We actually have grave sites, you know, picked out. We have a little graveyard on our farm that's empty now, but it'll be where I'm buried. And that gives me a lot of peace to know that I found my place. I don't have to wander anymore. And that I, I think S Southern Georgia specifically has a lot of troubles. You know, we're, we're not as progressive, we're more fundamentalist, we're more conservative. And, and I think my, like I've recently come, I'm an activist as well, and I've recently come to realize that that uh, my activism is very local, like profoundly local, and that that's probably my job on this earth. Like that's probably why I'm here is to honor my homeland, its history, its future, and my people. You know, affected as they are by all kinds of forces that that serve to divide them from each other and divide them from other peoples on the planet. I think that's my job. Mm. It's not an easy place for a progressive to live, but there I've been able to find community, you know, and community in its toughest form, community where work is really required of you to make it happen. You're reminding me of a phrase I've been using a lot and I wrote it in an essay a few years ago and I find myself using it again and again. And the line is, we can dwell on the things that divide us, but we dwell within landscapes that connect us. That's beautiful. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking of your landscape, which I'm a little familiar with. I've visited southern Georgia a couple times. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go off on an odd little tangent because okay. it so intrigues me, and I know a little bit about the history of this. Longleaf pine systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the piney Piedmont mm -hmm. played a very important role you talked about it being a conservative area, mm -hmm. politically speaking maybe, but it was also an area of revolution in, in ecology and in our understanding of conservation and the human role in landscapes. And mm -hmm. It had to do with fire mm -hmm. and the longleaf pine. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you could give us a little, just a little mm -hmm. brief mm -hmm. on longleaf pine and, and fire. So longleaf pine is the ecosystem that covered the southern uplands, and it, it traditionally inhabited 93 million acres from southern Virginia all the way to east Texas. One tree, you know, it looks like a, a monoculture, and where the diversity is, is in the understory. More, it's higher diversity than almost any place on the planet. 
So what happened is that these trees were very useful after the Civil War in reconstructing the whole country. I travel and find buildings everywhere in this country made of pines from where I come from. So the interesting thing about this pine, you're exactly right, is its relationship to fire. It's not, it's not it's, I, I, it's not fire dependent, meaning it's, it's, the cones will open whether there's fire or not, but it is fire dependent in that in the absence of fire, hardwoods creep in. And so because our area has um, historically had the most lightning strikes per square mile, you know, a, t a tremendous number, then um, so what happened is that a light, lightning would strike and start the wire grass on fire. Wire grass has evolved to be pyrogenic and uh, these fires would creep along for hundreds and thousands of miles even, burning the landscape, you know, before before Europeans arrived. And even after Europeans arrived, Bartram uh, in his travels wrote about seeing a fire in southern Georgia. And, and it's a beautiful aspect of that landscape. And so when they were figuring this out, when the ecologists and wildlife managers were trying to figure that back in the 1920s and 30s, the reason this was so important, because it was exactly in your region where they began to see fire not as an enemy of forests, mm -hmm. but in fact that the community depended on the role of fire. Mm -hmm. And that was a revolution. Foresters are supposed to put out fire, and here they were saying, no, we actually require fire. Yeah, we had to hush up Smokey the Bear there. And also then we learned that humans have been using fire for millennia, you know, right. to alter and change the landscape. And so we get into this much bigger question out of your place of mm -hmm. what the human role is and has been and mm -hmm. how that interacts with the natural forces and systems. Oh yeah, so, so it's really the question of our time, isn't it? Um, I've always I've always placed myself as an agrarian. I'm most comfor comfortable on a farm. And, and if, so if you look at this continuum from hunter-gatherer through agriculture, through industrialization, which is, you know, the, Anthropos the Anthropocene era, and into whatever is next, you know, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's some kind of incredible robotic computer technological age. Um, I have always been happiest sort of uh, at the edge of a field that borders some old growth forest. And so I've been, with, with the late research on that our human concepts of alteration of the earth actually started with the advent of agriculture. Those notions have been really hard for me to, to resolve in my mind. Uh, because I'm happiest, I'm, I'm just happiest in that place where we settle down and we begin to plant seeds and grow things, even in doing so, starting to destroy the fair, our mother, you know, the very planet that birthed us. So not able to reconcile that very well, I now, and, and unable in this society, in this culture, in this, these landscapes to return to hunter-gathering. I've returned to a farm, um, like many generations of my people before me in southern Georgia, still thinking about what's the right way to live? How shall we live? It's the greatest question. How are we going to live in the 21st century without destroying ourselves, our places, our landscapes, our atmosphere, childhood, this notion of childhood, um, without destroying justice, you know, and on and on, our prairies, our small farms, mm -hmm. our rivers, our forests. So that, you know, I am not coming to you with any answers. It's the questions that I wake up with every day. How shall we live? How shall I live? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of Leopold's phrase, Aldo Leopold's phrase on this is, he called it the great challenge of the future, how to live on a, or the oldest mm -hmm. actually challenge in our human 
history how to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. What you just said though, you don't have the answers, but what you do have is this awareness of connectivity. You start off mm -hmm. with a, your particular farm in your place and you see it connected mm -hmm. to global scale issues, to large questions of human justice, mm -hmm. to the next generation and our children and how we mm -hmm. help them connect. So what you seem to be especially sensitive to is a sense of connectivity of all these difficult dilemmas that we face. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure let me think about how I'm going to say this, Kurt. Mm. Uh, so I came, so we, came, we bought a farm. We came back to that place really because of a different thing, a one th different thing, and that is I began to lose faith in activism. I've been an environmentalist for a long time, year, decades now, and an environmentalist, and have you know, from the very first book that I wrote, my mission has always been to see a change in the way we treat the land and we treat the planet. So um, what happened after a time, you know, I was the kind of person too who would dress up in penguin outfits and get on, get in street festivals, you know, trying to bring attention to the climate chaos. And, and what I, I, I interviewed a woman one time, a, a gardener and a seed saver, a very mild woman who runs a tiny little seed company. And she said, I see in activism a kind of futility. The real, the real, like the real response to these broken systems we're living amid is, is creating alternative systems. And so I started thinking about that, you know, creating alternative systems and, and so I realized that really is my job now. It's how or am I going to continue to have quality of life? Now, that's such a scientific term for something that's so precious and immediate. Like, how am I going to wake up every morning with beauty in my life, with meaning, with community? I mean, we're losing all the things that are most precious to us. This idea of family, and now we're willing to pick up and travel across the country for a career, a job, anything. So, you know, we're, we're leading these homeless lives. So, for me, returning to place and figuring out a life there that, to me, has beauty and meaning and possibility for my children and my neighbors, meant everything to me. Mm. So it's a crazy life, you know. I, I look at my friends like Bill McKibben and I see all the amazing things they're doing. And then I look at myself and I think, maybe I'm doing exactly what needs to be done, which is in my own way, trying to remove myself as much as possible from a global industrial marketplace and, and return myself to this place-based, land-loving, resilient, community-filled life. And that's the life I want. Well, it strikes me, I mean, Janice, you're dealing with these really global scale issues, mm -hmm. and you've put, as Thoreau said, your faith in a seed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you've used the term a little bit now in, in the concept of seeds, and relocalizing is built into that. Tell us about seeds. So there's a little part I wrote, I, this last book that I wrote is called The Seed Underground, A Growing Revolution to Save Food. And, and I, there's a little part where I write about seeds. If you, know, if you haven't heard what's happening with seeds, let me tell you, they're disappearing. Just like everything else, the fish in the ocean, the birds in the sky. And um, the, the thing, a seed is a sacred thing. All of life is encapsulated in this. It's like a, it's, it's, it's got just millions of years of DNA in it. It's like a little memory stick that's holding all, the, all this information. And when we plant it, we have no idea what's going to come out. And what comes will be responses to the forces that have been uh, imparted on it. So seeds are, to me, they're the ultimate metaphor because it's what we need to be doing right now, planting seeds everywhere we go, literal seeds, metaphorical seeds. Um, a seed, to me, represents all of life. And that's how I've come about it. Is saving seeds going to save human civilization? No. 
but it's one more piece. It, a seed represents all our relations, and it's one more piece that we need to look at. So the real reason that I wrote about seeds was because I am seeing around me an increasing hopelessness, and I know that you and a lot of people are looking at hope and at hopelessness. So what I'd come to is that, um, do I have hope in the future? Do I have hope that we'll turn civilization around so that we begin to honor life on earth, this biome we live in, this gorgeous blue and green planet sailing through the universe? I actually don't have a lot of hope about that. But hope doesn't matter to me. You know, do you have hope that your daughter is going to turn out okay, and so you keep feeding her, and then you find out, oh no, she has Crohn's disease, so I quit feeding her. You know, I think doing what we do on this planet, planet, has nothing to do with hope. It has everything to do with love, and I think out of love springs this life force, this passion, this desire, which is fight. It's a fight to make things better. So, seeds, let's return to seeds again, this metaphor. The seed fights to bring, to birth life, you know? It has everything it needs. It's given some water and some sunlight and some warmth. And it opens and performs that magic over and over again, recreating itself. So, I think that we have to incorporate this idea of seeds into ourselves. Well, I'm, we've seen a pretty amazing change in just a few years when it comes to this theme of reconnecting communities and people to the land through food, through agri new systems of agriculture. I see a trem oh sorry. No, go. Please. I see a tremendous amount of very hopeful, very positive, meaningful sensible things happening right now. And, and it is not traditional activism. No. In the environmental world. Mm -hmm. And as you've watched this movement gain mm -hmm. traction and momentum, um, I'm struck by, of course, the fact that this isn't just a rural movement, it's partly mm -hmm. an urban movement. And so even though you may be focused on a rural landscape, do you see this as relevant into the cities as well? Oh, completely. I think this is completely relevant for the cities, and I agree. It's, it's, it's a movement of all peoples and all economies and all places, I agree. It's urban as well as rural, as well as suburban. Um, I, I remembered something that I wanted to say uh, uh, from a minute ago. And that is, um, I really wrote, I wrote about seeds because a young man that I knew died. He died at a party, partying on a balcony in Atlanta, and he somehow fell off the balcony. And um, I was at his funeral. It was a memorial service in the yard of his mother, who is my friend. And I was surrounded by young people. I could smell alcohol coming from them. I could see that some were smoking. Um, you know, they were doing their best to process grief. And I believe that grief is not, was not just the grief for their fallen friend, but also a grief for our oceans, our climate, our um, biodiversity, for everything. You know, like how can you be a young person now? Mm. So, um, I, like, it, in the moment of of seeing, of being in that memorial service, I realized that I needed to help young people find, just find more meaning, to realize that we don't need young people right now. We don't need any of us to drop out. We need people to drop in, you know, to start not building skyscrapers and new oil rigs and figuring out how to do fracturing more efficiently, but to build lives that, that are different on the landscape, that are transformative, that restore the best parts of existence. So 
I know I got a little bit off. So that's why I, mm -hmm. I that's why I wanted to write about seeds mm -hmm. is because I feel a hopelessness around me that I don't feel myself. Mm -hmm. For myself, I feel that all that matters is that I keep this love, this love of waking up to that bright orange sun rising every morning over the pecan orchard, you know, the the um, yellow crown kinglets flitting through the trees, wake to that love and that to activism then is a, is a natural response. So do I still believe in activism? I do. I think that we will be pushed in we, we are being pushed into it. We will be even more so. We have, I cannot, I can't abandon activism. Mm -hmm. It's necessary. But I think the recreation of, of systems that aren't broken, recreating the system, existing systems is something that we have to focus on. And so the book, this, I, I really am writing it to young people. Mm -hmm who I see taking up this movement. Somebody told me, I was in a conversation and they said, the reason why the local food movement and the organic food movement, the seed movement are so intensely popular, like wildly popular right now, is because these are things we can do something about. There's a lot about our lives. You know, I had to use fossil fuels to get here, to get to Chicago from, from where I live. Um, I'm no angel then, but I didn't fly. You know, I stopped flying five years ago. I am. I feel. I feel like we're on a continuum. I am in my life, and I am trying to move ever toward a more sustainable way of living. I have a long way to go. Hmm. Um, but every day, every molecule of me is pointed in that direction. That's. I think that we're born to serve. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lots of people don't think this. You know, they they have accepted these faux beliefs that we have unlimited resources, that we have an obligation almost, and a, definitely a right to use up those resources that now is more important than any other point on the geologic timeline, that pleasure is the purpose of existence, that it's okay, it's okay to look toward ideals of ease, of greed, of convenience. And I, some, some Somehow, I think differently. Hmm. I think that we're put here to serve. And the question becomes, what were you asked to do? You know, what is your service to this, to this, to, to humanity? You know, that's way off your topic mm -hmm. of cities. Now, that's... Look, I want to say one thing about cities and then you're going to keep asking. <laughs> Don't forget that question. I, I'm personally not... Uh, city-based. I'm not city-based and I've had a hard time wrapping myself around the idea of sustainable cities. I am undeniably, un unforgivably um, rural. I'm country. I know that. I think for our cities we have to recognize that there is no such thing as urban sustainability unless we recognize that a much larger footprint is feeding that. The cities are getting their clean water, their clean air, their food, everything is coming from outside. And I think all of us need to be doing all kinds of things that are going to help us conserve the resources that we have left and um, produce as much for ourselves as we can and that's going to include city folks too. So thank God there are movements in vertical farming and rooftop farming. It's just I know very little about it. Well, and it's not that complicated. If, if the whole landscape is not sustainable, then no one part of that landscape is going to be sustainable. Yeah. You can say in your city or your farm. Yeah. Or your wilderness area, your wild place, mm -hmm. unless the whole is sustainable. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not all that complicated. 
but we all live in our particular part of that spectrum and can contribute and have to. We're all trapped in living in these particular parts. Mm. I mean, we're, you know, it, it's, it's so much of, of our government's resources and our mental resources go to, to this idea of progress and, and I don't know, well, be a different world. It would, Kurt, it would be a different world if we put equal amounts of resources toward really learning how to be sustainable. Well, let's ground that in a really particular mm -hmm. situation. Uh, I know you have gotten this question because I get it all the time. Someone comes up to you, especially a younger person perhaps, and says, I am interested in doing this. I'm interested in going into farming. I have a piece of land, or I've acquired, mm -hmm. or I've inherited a piece of land. What should I do? What do you tell them? That's the question you get? What do you tell them? <laughs> what should start, I do with my land? I say start digging. <laughs> so they say not, so they say I have a piece of land and I want to be a farmer? Or I want, I'm, I'm, I'm re-inhabiting the land now. What do I do? Where should I start? I wrote a poem about this once about where you start re-inhabiting land. And that is you go off someplace and sit down and just listen for as long as possible and keep coming back and listening some more. What is amazing to me is that how much uh, more land-based peoples know about the earth that we don't know. So yeah, we can come, we can come to this with um, academic scholarly approaches and I think we have to rewild ourselves too, mm. you know. Well, it's interesting you would even use that term because we're talking about the agrarian landscape especially right now, but Mm -hmm. It's also rewilding in a sense. Well, remember, I'm living right there at the edge of that uh, old growth forest, so, you so need I the leave wild. the field and go walk in the woods a while. Well, then how do we then deal with this new term and new concept and framing for this whole big picture that we live in a world that's no longer wild? It's humanized. Yeah. We live in a man-made world. The Anthropocene is upon us. Yes. No, I agree. It definitely is. So the way I look at it is on that on that, um, that uh, what do you call that? That spectrum, spectrum yeah, that yeah. I talked about that moves toward technology. I just think that all our movement in general should, should be toward wilderness. You know, if, if, if wilderness represents hunter-gatherer and the farm field represents agrarian, the factory, I, I think all movement in terms of land use and human effort should be always toward the wild. Mm. A phrase that my friends here at the Center for Humans and Nature and I've been using lately is the relative wild. Mm -hmm. Understanding that there is not just urban places and wild places, there is agrarian in the middle and there are degrees of wildness in any place mm -hmm. and in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I have to think about that a little <laughs> bit, the relative wild. So what you're saying is that no place is really wild but every place is relatively wild. Or turn it the other way. No place is entirely human. There's mm -hmm. wildness inherent in any, and it's wildness inherent mm -hmm. in our own bodies, mm -hmm. as we now know from the study of the microbiome, mm -hmm. the diversity that exists within us. So I say, let movement be toward <laughs> the most relatively wild. <laughs> I love it. Well, we uh, touched on the theme of hope earlier. Mm -hmm. And you, you had some really interesting things to say about this. This is a question that's really intrigued me lately as I talk with friends and colleagues, as we all do. And you know, you have your bad days, mm -hmm. you have your good days. And, the, and, and so the concept of hope is, is a really complex one, is my main conclusion. It's not nearly as simple as we think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and we use the term pretty loosely. But just if you have any further thoughts, and I loved what you said earlier, but I just wonder mm -hmm. if you have any further thoughts on how you, what you hear when you listen to others and how they're responding. Are they hopeful and how do you even conceive of hope? Mm -hmm. no, what I hear mostly from others about hope is that it's a prerequisite for like action. If you are hopeless, you're depressed and therefore you're paralyzed and that I think is a dead end. I think we shouldn't even, we shouldn't really have a conversation about hope at all. I mean, this is beyond hope. That's 
kind of wise, you know. This is definitely beyond hope. Um, the conversation should be about, it should, it, I really think it should be about love. And, and you know, it's, it's terrible living in a, a culture dominated by industrialism and, and corporations because the message, the predominant message of our culture is to separate us from the things that matter, from each other from our families, our land, our places. And so I think that what our job is, is to create stories and art and um, ideas. I think that we should recreate culture that reminds us um, of what we love. Mm. And that should be our, that should be our predominant occupation on this earth, that what we do moves us to love. Is that too simplistic? No, well, when I'm hearing this, and it's kind of going to the kind of last question I actually want to ask, but it's kind of circling around to where we began. This is all coming from a deep place inside of you. It comes from your connection to your place that you knew and grew up in and grew out of and are growing back into and continually mm -hmm. growing through. So maybe, maybe you can help us, those of us who don't come from your place, understand how important this is and how deeply. What should we, who are not from southern Georgia, know about that place and how it's inspired you? And it evoked this sense of deep love for, for your place. What is it in that place that you can share with the rest of us? Um, what I'd like to share about my place is... Uh, defense and that is we're not open for destruction um, we're not we're our doors aren't open for taking what we have we love our place um, the South has has suffered a lot of taking and uh, because of it its people have suffered and so I would like to see that change. I would like to see us honoring uh, my landscape and what it offers, which is incredible springs, first magnitude springs coming up from the ground, these amazing hardwood forests, swamps, the Okefenokee, salt marshes, and, and realize that, that um, we're going to fight degradations against our place. Those of us who don't know your place so intimately, mm -hmm. you come here, I can tell you, I can walk you outside and show you a bur oak tree mm -hmm. and say why that is so evocative of this region mm -hmm. and what it means for the larger conceptual questions. So again, I, it's just a kind of an open question of those of us who don't know your place so intimately, mm -hmm. what is the most important value or what's the character of that place that's so important that the rest of us should appreciate? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question, and I'm not sure that I actually can answer it. Um, I would, so, so I think that a sense of place definitely derives out of these things that are unlike any other place. And the, where I live in southern Georgia, we have those things, you know. Our rivers, for example, are chocolate covered, are coffee colored and don't have rocks in them, have sand, white sand banks. Um, we have cypress trees, and I'm not sure you have cypress trees, or I know you don't have longleaf pine trees. This, this majestic, magnificent tall tree that built ships and really rebuilt this country. So that's probably, if I wanted you to love my place the way I love it, I would probably just take you out into it. And you know, like here, this, smell this oyster. This is the smell of the Georgia coast <laughs> on a summer day. Or dive into this tannic water. Let me take you to the middle of Okefenokee Swamp and let you hear the prothonotary warblers singing, mm. you know? I think that's what I would do. And then I would feed you some good southern food. I'm coming. <laughs> and the last thing I would say, just as you were describing that, though, I was reflecting. One of the first, I woke up this morning, and the first thing I heard was a sandhill crane. Uh -huh. 
How did I miss those this uh, morning? Well, you were sleeping too late. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> but I was reflecting the Okefenokee is one of uh -huh. the places where cranes winter. Our cranes from the north, from this part of the country, come down to Georgia. So we are, even though in different places, we are connected by the creatures, mm -hmm. by the systems, mm -hmm. by the history. And so we are really in one place the whole earth, but we know our particular places and our special places mm -hmm. intimately. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll close it off with, by asking about that connectivity and how you appreciate that, that connectivity across landscapes. Um, we, know, we know from conservation biology that when land is fragmented, species disappear. And I think that's what I would say about that, is it has to be that the reverse is true. That when we put things back together, communities flourish. And in that lies my love, my hope, my possibility, is that in returning, our, in returning things to wholeness, that we return ourselves to the earth and re we return ourselves to each other. Yeah. Thanks, Janice. Thank you. Boy, that was so tough. <laughs> We're done. <laughs>